for this. Okay, yeah, I was gonna say something about the um, the first letter that John no, wrote. Him. I've and told him. Yeah. I said she said there I muted her. She didn't know she was on. Uh, in the second chapter of the book of Revelations. Um the letter to the to the Ephesians, the very first letter, um, where it says, verse two, I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how that cannot bear them which are evil and has tried them that say they are apostles and are not, and found them to be liars. It's very possibly there, maybe talking about, if you remember uh, Paul's last visit with the elders at Ephesus, in, Revel in Acts 20, when he said that after my departure, grievous wolves will enter in, men of your own selves. He, he, he showed that some of those men he was talking to was going to rise up and try to take uh, a leadership role that they didn't have. And uh, But that church was evidently established well enough that they could determine, you know, who really was an apostle that, uh, you know, had the authority to carry on with the work that Paul had established there. And, uh, of course, in this... Um, letter, I believe, beyond the six verses, but thou hast, this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Um, and that seems to go along with possibly this spirit of apostles that say they're apostles and aren't, because it's pretty obscure to try to find out the exact uh, definition of a Nicolaitan, um, but if you study the resources of it, it does look like that that a, that the, that a Nicolaitan was a spirit among men that are basically dictators that um, that uh, conquer the people. That's what the, the word Nicolaitan or Nicholas, the name, is thought that one of the eight men in, in Acts, that the, the elders that were appointed by the original apostles, it's thought there's a possibility that that Nicholas was the one that uh, fell away and, and uh, actually established this uh, mindset. And it's a problem that we still have today. You know, it's for men not to, uh, especially men that are, uh, if they have a, a great gift of God, it's easy for them to dominate people. And they may not even realize what they're doing. That, but there are men <clears throat> that, can become dictators, you know, that control people. They ne their people never can grow up. They can never develop because they're always held down. Um, I, sometimes it may seem like a man, you know, you have to be careful about what you're saying about that because there's there are men, there's people under people's ministry that does need corrected and uh, I know in my ministry, there's, you know, I had a woman ask me one time, why are you harder on my husband? Why, oh, why? No, she said, why are you harder on other men, but you don't ever correct my husband like you do other men? 
And I told her, I said, because your husband couldn't take that and run him off. He, he wouldn't, he would not be able to bear it. That, that family's not in this church anymore. So I'm not, so don't get to wondering who I'm talking about. <laughs> but, um, you know, they're, you know, you're dealing with in this, in this setting that we have in the body of Christ, the ministry is dealing with babes in Christ all the way up to people that really are mature enough that they don't need very much of a strong hand on them. They're, they're mature enough in the Lord that they understand order. They understand uh, the doctrines, uh, the vision well enough that they don't need a whole lot of correction. There's always people that's been around a long, long time that, that don't do things necessarily right. You know, but at a certain after a certain age, you just let you have to let people go and let God. But the bottom line is, is that we can't, you know, control people or like this spirit of Nicolaitans or men that are say they're apostles and aren't. The, those men have to be men that 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 want to exercise authority, but they don't truly have the authority. To be trying to exercise it and it's not the spirit of a servant you know uh when you look at jesus you know it brother green and i were talking today uh, there's a there was a uh, let me let me look at this i want to make sure i quote this right Oh, here we go. It was a statement concerning, you know, uh, principles. Sometimes we have to work on these principles to actually get them right. Um, let me see if I can. I don't think I have it in. Where I thought it did, but I'll get it for you in just a second. Okay, yeah, here it is. That it was stated that love produces trust. And trust produces unity. And unity produces fellowship. But I think we may have to adjust that because I think fellowship produces trust. I mean, let's get these maybe sorted in a better order because <clears throat> like you're, you, when you come into fellowship with Jesus, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie this into this spirit here. Um, let, me, let me go back before I say a little bit more about that here in the scripture of second revelations, the second chapter. I know thy works. This is verse two, and thy patience. Try them. Okay. Uh, verse three, and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. He is admiring them and and um, uh, uh, edifying the good things that they did. But then in verse four, it says, I, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou have lost, lost thy first love. Um, for, remember them, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do thy first works or else I'll come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. Um, here, the main correction that he was given them 
was that um, they had lost their first love. And I mentioned there a couple of weeks ago that how you can, um, you know, when you first come to the Lord and he forgives you of your sins and, and you know that God has dealt with your life, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a personal endeavor that you have with God in salvation. It's not, salvation is not something that, you know, I just have, I have to believe that I'm saved because I went through the process. No, no, when God really saves you, you have God dealing with you and even in, even in repentance, God's, re, God's dealing with you is emphatic enough that you know that the Lord has um, individually uh, dealt with you. Like Jesus said, no man cometh unto me except my father draws him. You know God has individually um drew you to him by his spirit and you can't there's no way you can't hardly tell you know in, in in the same way when you receive the baptism of the holy ghost uh it's hard to explain to somebody what happened to you but you know you received it you know you were born again you know there was an experience with god that's undeniable i know when i was a little boy uh and I received the Holy Ghost. I've tried. I wished I somebody had wrote it down in the back when me and my brother got the Holy Ghost. By the way, um, uh, Bridget and Penelope got the Holy Ghost in in Dallas this uh, Pat, uh, Sunday. They were visiting in Dallas, and both those little girls got the Holy Ghost. So. Uh, there's a, there's a little bit of time between them in their natural birth, but they're twins, like me and my brother. Uh, when it comes to being born to the Lord, I don't know which one of them got through first, which one of them's oldest. <laughs> it may be like Penny. Maybe Penny got it first. I don't know. Somebody maybe tell us. The fishers are on there. Maybe y'all tell us which one got it first. Or maybe nobody knows. I don't know. Uh, but I think they're on here. Um, but anyway, I'm just mentioning that, uh, yeah, the fit, the one of you, is somebody in the Fisher family hearing us? Can you tell us? Yes, sir. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. I don't know. I think Penelope may have, but I was working with Bridget, so I, I'm not really for sure as far as that goes. Okay. Well, the main thing is that they got it, but I was just, you know, wondering. But anyway, they got it on the same at the, on the same day. But um, anyway, uh, I'm just I'm I'm trying to relate to the fact that it's a it is a personal experience, and there's a love there that. You, you fall in love with God because of you, you feel the washing of and removing of, of your sins. It, it's white slate, your slate's white clean. And then in the new birth of the Holy Ghost, you, you know that God has, has made himself real to you in a new birth. Jesus said it this way. He said, he said, you, you, um, Concerning, he li he likened the baptism of the Holy Ghost to wind. He said, "You, uh, you know, how did he say that? That uh, uh, you don't know? Is he, did he say you don't know from whence it came or where it went when the wind blows? But you just know the wind blew, and and it's the same way with somebody that's born of the Spirit of the Holy Ghost." You can't explain, you know, all you know is, is it, I got it. The, the, you know, that wind blew when Jesus told his disciples to receive the Holy Ghost. He blew on them. 
he, he blew in their face and said, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he likened it. And on the day of Pentecost, he said it was like a mighty Russian wind. It was a definite something that happened uh, that you knew it happened, but you really can't explain it. It's almost unexplainable to explain a new birth in the spirit unless you're talking to somebody that's got it also. They can understand what you're talking about. But trying to get somebody that they never experienced it to understand it, it's very, in fact, it just didn't, there ain't enough words to put it into explanation. But these people, they lost their first love. And I may mention that it's necessary to learn the mechanics of the kingdom of heaven. It's necessary to understand the um, the the natural works of serving God. It's necessary to understand doctrine. It's necessary to understand order. It's necessary to understand standard, the standard of living, not living like a worldly person anymore, but having uh, in your behavior, the character of righteousness. Uh, and so, uh, but, but in doing that, you can, you can get out of balance and lose your focus and you can put your emphasis, you can get your emphasis on the mechanics instead of your relationship with Christ. And when you do that, there's where you lose. Uh, if you're if you're putting your faith in the mechanics, I've met people that that because they have a, a great holiness standard, they equate that holiness standard to how righteous they are, and that that is serving a different God than Jesus Christ. See. That matter of fact, it's it's that self righteousness. It, I mean, the the mechanics is important, but you don't want to get out of balance. They're and they're necessary. You you got to have order. You've got to have, um, you got to uh, put uh, a natural behavior or an everyday behavior, a righteous behavior, in your everyday walk. But if you're looking at that rather than your relationship with the Lord. You know, just like for an example, a minister, just like these men that said they were apostles and were not, they obviously wanted to be um, in authority. They obviously wanted to have a position that they, they didn't have a gift to hold that position. And therefore they were putting an emphasis in their desire for that position above what God really called them to do and doing the will of God and being a servant to God's people and being a servant of the Lord to do his will and what he called them to do. I've said many times that it's really important to know who you are and where you are in your walk with God. It's really important to, to not be thinking higher of yourself than what you should be. It's also important that you shouldn't be thinking lower of yourself than you should be thinking. Now, I don't like to hear people say that they're good for nothing. I, I think that that's okay. Maybe when you first come to God, that you realize I ain't, I ain't worth nothing. Brother Green and I were talking today about how when we, well, we were sharing our experiences about how when we first came to the body of Christ, we thought we had something that we, we you know, Brother Green was telling about how he'd been through seminary and he knew the Bible and he, he thought he had something that, you know, he could give this body. And I was telling him, you know, the same thing with me. I, I thought, you know, when I got here and found this body, I thought, I'm going to help these people. 
But I said, yeah, I wasn't here very long that I realized I didn't have nothing. I realized, you know, I was empty. I thought I knew something, but I didn't know nothing when I began to hear these men talk. And uh, so it, you know, we had to go, we had to go through a humbling process to realize where we really were and who we really were, where we was in God's, you know, what our statue was, status, status was in God and in the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and uh, uh, you know, I was talking to him today about a man that uh, 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 was, uh, you know, I found this man that seemed to be interested, uh, Dominican, here lives in this area, has a church. I went and visited his church. It didn't take me but one visit to realize that he's that this man is he's got a fairly new work and he's got a good work. He's got a good group of people. They're all Latinos. Um, they all speak Spanish. But he he's too full right now. He there is no way that you're gonna get him to believe he needs anything because he, you know, like Jesus said, he that's sick needs a physician. This guy don't know he's sick right now. So I want to befriend him, but I don't think there's any way I can help him right at this time. But the Lord can help him in God's time. And uh, so it, 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 what I'm, you know, referring to here is, is that you can get out of balance. These people lost their first love. You can put, that's what I'm saying, you can get your focus off of your walk with God. You know, when you first come to God, you're very sensitive about what you're doing that pleases God. And if you do anything that you that God convicts you of, that makes you feel like you're not pleasing me. And, but as you begin to learn, and I, I'm calling it the mechanics, but I'm, I'm, I'm talking about, like I said, to learn the ways of the kingdom of God, which entails the doctrine, it entails uh, the uh, um, uh, the standards and the order. Those three things are, the, are three key things that we have to uh, learn and develop at the same time, I'm saying if we get our focus off of that and we get our focus on, like, for example, if I'm, if I'm following order better than anybody else and I think that that makes me better than everybody else and my focus is on order, or let's, like I said, it could be on standards. I've met people that have holiness standards that they're so holy, they're no earthly good. You know, they... You, you know, they think they're somebody because they have a high, high standard of dress. Uh, and and it, it almost makes them filthy because of the spirit that they have about it. Now, does that mean we shouldn't have standards? Absolutely not. We should have, we should dress. We should have, we should be careful that we're, um, that we hold up a standard of righteousness in all that we do, but you can you can get uh, uh, out of balance with that is what I'm saying. And if you put all your emphasis on that, and you lose that first love, uh, then you're going to miss. And here's what I was saying that. Uh, I wanted to go back to this thought of principles that I'm saying fellowship. Uh, fellowship uh, causes trust. When you get in fellowship with Jesus Christ, you begin to learn about him. You begin to learn you can trust him. You begin to to realize that he is a savior, that 
His wisdom is from above. It's pure. You, the more you learn about his ways, the more fellowship where you're in with him. The, and how did John say it? That um, when he said in when in First John that we have fellowship with one another. If we uh, let's see if we can get that script. Lay down our last. I don't know who keeps unmuting. I keep muting Brother Paul's deal, and it gets, keeps getting unmuted. Um, okay, let's see here uh, in First John. Let's see First John can... chapter one, verse six, five, six, seven. Okay, Brother Green, thank you. If we say we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. For if we walk in the light, as He's in the light. We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So uh, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, in other words, that, that when we have fellowship with him, we will begin to learn of him. We'll begin to learn of his ways. We'll begin to be sensitive enough to the spirit of God walking in the spirit that is that the spirit our relationship with christ is in the spirit and that fellowship with him in the spirit it begins to create a greater light or understanding knowledge and understanding of him if you put your <laughs> i hope i'm making myself clear if you put your focus on the understanding that you know, if you start getting exalted in, in knowledge or understanding, you, you're, you're going to get out of balance and lose that intimate relationship with you have with him and fellowship. But that I'm saying fellowship develops trust. It's the same way if I have a brother in the Lord and I don't really know him very well and I start fellowshipping and getting annoyed. It, that fellowship breaks down barriers and walls of, of um, it breaks down walls of uh, uh, mistrust or, or fear or not knowing, you know, not understanding. But the more fellowship you have with someone, the better you get to know them. And, uh, and then how does this say this, that uh, fellowship, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm the one that's saying this, is that fellowship produces trust, and then trust produces unity, and unity produces love. The, the statement that was made was that love produces trust. Well, see, I don't think you can have enough love to that's not going to cause you to trust somebody that may be untrustworthy. But it's going to, it'll take unity. And the unity that you have with God, that unity that you have with Him, uh, or, or let me, let me, the fellowship you have with Him. It causes you to trust him. It causes you to trust the word of God. This, if you have fellowship with him, you walk in light because you begin to understand his righteousness as you get to know him and understand the truth of the word of God in your walk with him. Sometimes I think, um, it, uh, like for an example, let me just say, let's just say a man is, or even a group of people are interested in, you know, building the kingdom of God, building the body, but their focus is on having more churches. Their focus is on uh, having uh, bigger churches, nicer churches. And there's where they put their emphasis, but they're not putting their emphasis on Christ and righteousness, the love of God, the, the intimacy that you have with the Lord. And if you're just building something because you're proud of it, you know, Brother Linegar was the man that came out in the body and said, you can't be proud of nothing. 
<laughs> I remember when Brother Clyde Patton said, he stopped him at the campground. He said, Brother Langer, we can't be proud of nothing. Brother Langer said, no, Brother, Brother Patton, we can't be proud of nothing. God resists the proud, but he gives, he, he, uh, he draws nigh to the humble. God loves the humble, but he don't love the proud. <laughs> a proud spirit is a self-righteous spirit. It's a selfish spirit. It's a self-uplifting spirit. Uh, so we can't be proud. Brother Linger said, you got to change that and change it to thankfulness. You got to be thankful. You can't be proud of your children because they made straight A's in school. You've got to be thankful that you got children that you've been able, that they've been able to be influenced by you of the things of God that they will work hard and do and labor. It's one of the things I was talking to Brother Green about today. I said, it doesn't make no difference if you're in the poorest country in the world. It doesn't matter. If I don't care if you're in Haiti, that's I don't know of a country any any poverty stricken than Haiti. But God is able to sustain you. He's able to sustain you anywhere. He he said, don't give any thought of where you're going to. Let's read it in in Matthew six. What scripture is that, Brother Green? Um, I believe it's uh, Mark chapter 6, verse uh, 28 through 31, 33, 34, I believe. I think it's in Matthew 6 in those scriptures you're talking about. I'm thinking we may both be wrong. No, it is. It's in, here's where he said, uh, let's see, no man can serve two masters for either he'll hate the one and love the other or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat in the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, neither nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are they not, are ye not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubic unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, he sh shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith. Therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whether wherewith all shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek, the ungodly. For your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. Now, here's the key, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Therefore, take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow will take thought for itself, things of itself, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. That's a promise from the Lord that if you put the Lord first, see, that first love, if you, if you, your focus is on pleasing the Lord and on his saving grace and his intimate 
place in your heart and yours and his that you found when he saved you, then he's promised, I'll take care of you. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're at or how poor of a country you live in. God will take care of you if you put him first in everything. Now, he may not make you rich. He, you know, you may be like Jesus told, who was it, Martha? Said the poor you've always got with you. Uh, or was that his disciples when she bathed his, when she anointed his feet? Um, that you, you know, so you're going to have poverty stricken. You may be in poverty stricken country. I'm not saying God's going to rich you, raise you up. <clears throat> I'm not a charismatic that believes God's going to give you anything you think you've, you you want. I don't believe in that false doctrine. <clears throat> you're probably going to wind up in the culture and the society that you're living in. But God will take care of you there and he'll sustain you and he will bless you. I think God will bless you. Uh, and uh, if you put him first, that's what Jesus was saying there. And that sort of brings us back to the fact that um, that you can lose your first love and put your focus on the mechanics of serving God, building the kingdom of God. You, I hope I'm, I hope I'm making sense to y'all of what I'm saying that, that your focus and, and your motive can get out of balance and you can get your focus on the wrong thing in serving God. Uh, You know, to try to hear, he knew their works. He knew their patience. I had the patience and care to work with God. Uh, I think sometimes I got saints that think they know more about saving people than I do. And so they, they go about trying to save people, just working iniquity and doing all kinds of things. When they are to watch the ministry and realize that they're not going to help that. You know, they don't have the patience to wait on God to see what God wants to do. And it, it causes more trouble. It doesn't help the situation. But you can't always, you can't always, you can't fix that. Somebody asked me, I was telling, now I mentioned this here recently, but somebody asked me the other day, I was up talking in another church, and somebody asked me, Brother Smith, could you tell us what the, what is the, uh, what's the restored church going to look like? I said, it's going to be problems, problems, problems. That's what it's going to look like. We're going to have a whole bundle of flesh. And uh, we're going to have people with problems coming from everywhere in the world. And our job is going to be to help those people get all of that sin out of their life and all of the wrong spirit. And I said, read the New Testament. If you want to know what it's going to look like, read Paul's letters. He had problems everywhere he ran. He got run out of towns. He, he you know, had men rise up above him. He, he you know, he has all time dealing with men. He's asking the Corinthians. How do you want me to come? What kind of spirit do you want me to come in? Do you want me to come and correct y'all or do you want me to come in love? How, you know, how do you want me to deal with, with the situation y'all are in? Uh, so, um, anyway, uh, we, we, Matt, I'm telling you, when, when I'm looking at what God is doing in this world and realize the job that's ahead of the, the men and the saints of God and the body of Christ, we, we just have to be humble enough to say without God's help, we're, we, we're helpless. We cannot accomplish it. But with God's help, we can do all things. With the Lord, with God helping us, we can accomplish what he wants us to accomplish. But 
here, you know, I'm going to go back and say this fellowship with the Lord is going to, it's going to develop trust. We're going to learn how to trust. Let me see if I, you know, people get on and they don't realize their, their, their microphone's not muted. So, but, but the, I'm muting them as quick as I hear it. Uh, but anyway, uh, so I just, you know, this thought has been in my mind. Not only uh, does that fellowship create a trust. Now, when I start trusting you and you start trusting me, that then we come into a greater unity. When I start trusting the Lord, I get in more unity with him because I begin to understand his ways more. I begin to learn him when my when my desire is to do the will of God and that I long for his to his play to please him and to have his favor on my life because I realize that he is the righteous one and he's there to help me. He's my mediator. He's my great, he's my high priest. He's my great physician. He's my help in the time of need. He's my shield and my buckler. He's all to me. And when I long to enhance that relationship and that fellowship that I have with him, it's going to bring us into a greater unity. When I get in unity with him, that's going to create love. I can love my enemy because I can have the wisdom of Christ of knowing that my enemy is a servant bound by sin. It's a, they're servants of sin. They're prisoners of sin. And my pity can go out to them. I can love the person, but I can hate the spirit that's got a hold of them and the sin that's got a hold of them. Jesus, when you watched him, he didn't take, he wasn't, it didn't take him a minute to rebuke a, a, a proud religious uh, person that thought they were a leader that was had the wrong spirit that tried to, you know, uh, really they were digging at him. It didn't take him long to discern their spirit and rebuke them for it. But then they, they could bring somebody like Mary Magdalene to him and say, you know, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. And the law says to stone her. What do you say? And he just reached down and started writing in the sand. And one by one, they just began to walk away. And in a little while, he looked up and they were all gone. And he said, woman, where is your accusers? And she said, they're gone. And he said, neither do I can accuse you or condemn you. Go and sin no more. See, <clears throat> now the righteousness of the law said that a person that committed such an act was, was guilty and their judgment was death. But, this, but the spirit that was really behind the law that Jesus came to show them was is that that if you got a spirit that you're trying to judge somebody and you don't, you don't even have, you got enough wrong in your life, you ain't got any business doing that. The, the law is righteous and it can judge righteously, but you can't judge righteously is what he was saying to those men and whatever he wrote in the dirt. He was showing them, you're not capable of judging this. You need to go and get your own self straightened out. And then he forgave her because he understood the corruption that was in Judaism at that time. And of course he was bringing about a new covenant that he was exercising that new covenant in himself uh, as well as fulfilling the law at the same time. He, he threaded a very fine needle uh, opening of the needle there in his walk with God. But anyway, I, I just, you know, th this has been something that's uh, just been on my mind lately. And I've just thought, well, I, I, 
you know, it would be maybe good if I just dwell on it a little bit more and just share my heart with you a little bit more. And, and one of the reasons is, Joel, mute your, mute your camera. So um, uh, I, um, you know, I, I just feel like that this first love and what, and, and, and what I was going to say was, is I think it's a pertinent because here at least the Lord was dealing with these seven churches right before AD 70, because the time was so short that for them to make the bride, the, the lights were fixing to go out, the candlesticks were fixing to be removed. And these churches still were called seven golden candlesticks. There's seven stars. He walked among the seven golden candlesticks, which was those churches. The seven stars of those churches were the bishops and ministers of those churches. But he was, re, he was threatening to remove this candlestick if they didn't repent. And that word repent don't just mean say, I'm sorry, but you need to turn and quit doing what you're doing and get back to your first love. Go do your first works over again. Get back on your knees and find that relationship with the Lord. And that's why I'm saying, I think that we can apply this, what happened back there while the church was in the stages, the last stages of falling away, that I think we're entering the last stages of restoration. So I think it applies to us, even though we've never been in the place I was telling Brother Green today, we was talking a little bit about, I was talking to him about how God will sustain you, no matter who you are, no matter how poor a country you're from, no matter what condition you're in. You don't never want to put your trust in man. You, you want your trust to be in the Lord. You want to put him first. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all these things are going to be added to you. That's just automatically God is going to sustain you if you're serving him like you should be. If you're walking in the relationship, you should be walking in with him. And I reminded him of how the early church, that the persecution was so great in the condition back there in Rome after the day of Pentecost, that the people in the body of Christ sold everything they had and came and laid it at the apostles' feet so that they could see to it that everyone had what their needs met. What, what, well, how do you think that doctrine would fly today? <laughs> <laughs> See, we're not living in a place like that. In fact, it would be wrong for a ministry to ask people to do something like that today. Brother Green's question to me was, do you think we're ever going to see that happen again down here in this world? I said, it may happen. Brother, Brother Gary Green had a dream. He, he told about it at the convention center, but he called me. Uh, in fact, he texted me real early in the morning because he had that dream in the middle of the night and he couldn't sleep. And I don't know, I think it's like 4.30, 5 o'clock when he sent me a text. He couldn't stand it any longer. He wanted to tell it to somebody. And he told me the dream. He, and, and here's the best I can uh, relate to the dream he had. Uh, he said, uh, I had a dream of this enormous beast. I can't describe it. I've never seen a beast like this. It was like a hundred foot tall. It was like 40 or 50 foot wide. And it was just strolling along and it, but it devoured everything that got in its way. I mean, it ate rocks and trees and, and uh, other beasts. If anything got in its way, it devoured it. And the spirit said to him in this dream, said, 
This beast is in Canada and it's headed straight to America. And the beast spoke up and said, I'm Adam's beast and I'm Nimrod's pet. And in the dream, Brother Green said, he said, uh, I don't remember reading in the Bible about Nimrod having a pet. And he said, the beast said, that's because I devoured him before he named me. Brother Green said, I don't have a clue, Brother Smith, what this means. He said, Can, do you have any idea what this dream is about? And I said, yeah, I do. He said, tell me. I said, socialism's in Canada. It's a devouring spirit. It devours everything in its way. It's bigger than anything. It's the only, it's the predecessor. The only thing bigger than it's dicta, dictator, dic, a dictatorship. I said, you go back to Canada and talk to people that's in that, in that socialistic government and find out how much they like it. Find out how much that country controls them and devours everything. I said, it's headed to America. I said, for America to be able to build an image to the beast, it will have to not only, and if you listen to our radical government right now, you can tell they're headed straight into socialism. That's what they want. And, and for them, for America, for the two-horned beast in Revelations 13 to turn the, the power, their power. They're going to speak as a dragon, but they're going to turn their power over to the, the, the beast before them, and it's going to become the eighth head. That's the Pope of Rome, and that is a dictatorship. I said it, it'll devour rocks. That's the ungodly. It'll devour trees. That's the righteous. It'll devour other beasts. That's other religious systems. It'll devour everything. It'll all come under that one system. If you'll study uh, Hitler's, um, Hitler's ma mannerism or motive of how he brought Germany under that spirit, it started out as a, dic as a socialistic way, and then, it, then he turned into a dictator. And he put a spirit in the people that they were willing to murder and kill anybody he won't kill, thousands and millions of Jews. Whatever his idea was of a pure race, he was able to put that in the people. And when you look at the spirit that was in the people that, it, that raided our capital in Washington, you would never think something like that could happen in the United States of America, but it did. And, you know, I don't, I don't really necessarily want to be a, a, a prophet of doom, but I'm just going to tell you, we're, we've got a world to deal with here. And in the end of this world, God is going to judge God's judgment. And this world is, is a cruel world and it's getting wicked, more corrupt, but God will sustain and, and protect his people. But the only hope we've got right now is not government. The only hope we've got is the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, uh, I, I just want to encourage you to work on, work on your intimate relationship with the Lord. Don't lose that first love and don't get caught up or get moved off of your foundation of that intimate relationship with the Lord. Uh, don't get your eyes on uh, the mechanics. The mechanics will take care of themselves if you put him first and keep that fellowship and relationship with him. If you keep that on the front on your on the, on the front burner of your life, so to speak, everything else will fall in place. I know, I know we're living in a world, in a society that it's, you have to work at it because it won't come natural. Because they're like, we're like 
trout or salmon. We're more like salmon, you know. Uh, we're we got the whole everything's going downstream, and we're trying to go upstream uh, during this season season that we're, that God's uh, you know the the fertile season. You know, and you could use that in type that the Lord's going to bring about His likeness. Anyway, I've talked long enough. Uh, I was going to try to hold it down a little bit today, but I hope I'm getting myself across to you. If not, we'll just take some of what you don't understand. I'm saying just put it on the shelf and we'll take it down and work on it some more later. I love all of you. I appreciate your goodness and, and uh, the saints of God here in Little Rock, but I love all of God's people and appreciate all of those that tuned in here with us tonight. And uh, we'll talk to you later. Before we go, everybody unmute your microphones. Let's pray together. Ask God to keep touching Brother Dawson, Keswick, Canada, uh, the body of Christ, this, the churches, uh, Brother Ray Weaver, Brother Bill Daniels. I'm asking God to heal Brother Daniels and give us a miracle. We need Brother Daniels. I'm just asking the Lord to consider him, to consider his faithfulness, consider his love for, for the body of Christ. And so I'm asking God to touch him. Brother Weaver, Sister Susan, wouldn't you like to see God um, deliver them and, and turn their lives? Or wouldn't that be a testimony? Sure it would. And uh, so pray with us about that. And uh, brother, pray for brother uh, Kennedy in Dallas. His wife did pass away. And uh, so pray for the Dallas church, brother Kennedy. Um, Sister Julie Crafton, uh, brother Lewis's grandson in, in Norfolk, Virginia, remember them. Uh, I know there's so many needs that we have. I'm just trying to mention the ones that I'm aware of that are urgent. Uh, but let's give the Lord a praise in our prayer tonight. Also. Oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Help us draw closer to you, dear Lord. Jesus. Lord. Hallelujah. Lord. 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 Lord.
are not here local, maybe we'll see you next Thursday. God bless all of you and have a good night. Bless you. Bye. God bless. Bye. Good night, everybody. Good night. Bye. Bye bye. I can hear real good back then.